Hello everyone, uh, that pronunciation was right. Yes, I'm Deepti Nanda Kumar and um, I work on X265. Um, we have been working on this for about two and a half years. And um, for, for those who have missed some of the updates, I don't think there was an X265 talk last year, but there probably was one the year before that. So um, just a quick update. Um, the mission of X265 was to become the best open source HEDC encoder, um, highest compression efficiency and the best performance. Uh, yeah, we had, um, we have lots of um, uh, nice goals. It has the same um, dual license uh, model that X264 has, um, so GPL V2 as well as a commercial license for those who want to put it in their product software or hardware. Um, development is led by uh, multi-core web and um, uh, the, initially, the initial development was kick-started and commercially funded by a group of companies who were called our charter members. And um, this essentially just allowed us, allowed us to share risk and minimize, uh, <coughs> minimize problems. And in return, they received um, a few commercial licenses based on their investment. Um, we license the rights um, to modify and uh, utilize X264 source code and key algorithms. Um, this helped for a lot of the assembly optimizations at the 16 by 16 and 8 by 8 levels. And of course, what, what remained, we had we implemented it mostly ourselves. So uh, that's kind of like the quick introduction for X265. And um, again, uh, I'm go um, it, it's probably a very non-linear talk for you because I'm mostly we're going to talk about what are the major improvements we've done in the last one year. And obviously, the, the scale of improvements is considerably lesser than the scale of improvements over the year before that. But we do have some, uh, uh, some decent uh, updates. So features. Uh, in terms of features, what has kept us busy? Um, when we started off, we based ourselves on the HM codec. So uh, really, many of the features were there. Uh, except that it just wasn't usable. So we started off disabling a lot of the features, removing it, then slowly working around it and enabling some of these features. And uh, towards last year, we reached a stage where uh, most of the key uh, features, all the advanced coding tools, weighted prediction, by prediction, uh, we had a decent rate control that we uh, developed from scratch with help from X264 team. Um, so most of the key features were in there, but right now we have been adding uh, some extra options which basically make, X260, make the X265 encoder a lot um, more usable. So one of those that we added was limit refs, which basically uh, at a block level, it intelligently chose the references to be used for prediction as opposed to turning off, as opposed to the user specifying the number of references. If the user specified three or five, it would always analyze three or five references. But now the encoder intelligently chooses based on heuristics which um, references to um, analyze and which ones to not analyze. So it basically uses references from smaller blocks uh, to decide what reference to analyze for the larger block. And similarly, at 2n by 2n size, it uses the references um, as it saves those references and when it does inter, intra and rect, rect and inter analysis, it uses those references. So basically this allows us to increase the number of reference frames that are available to the encoder, but not spend so much time uh, doing analysis at a block level. So yeah, it did give us some uh, good uh, performance gains, about 40% with very less uh, encode efficiency loss. Visually, they were exactly transparent, um, but yeah, uh, objective metrics in terms of SSI, we did end up losing about 0 0.02 dB or so, which was hardly uh, measurable. So uh, this is one key feature which uh, we hope we will now push it into uh, default, enable it by default as opposed to a special command line. Um, yeah, in rate control, uh, we have been working heavily on um, rate control in X265. Uh, one of the key features that we implemented was um, the concept of a quantization group. Uh, this was introduced in HEDC um, uh, in the specification where they said that you could have different QPs for blocks going up to 8 by 8 or 16 by 16. And uh, uh, earlier we just had individual QPs for, for a 64 by 64 CTU 
and now we introduced support to do adaptive QP at the sub CTU level as well. So uh, in X265 we have restricted it to 16 because we find there's pretty much no um, advantage going below uh, 16 and also the default is uh, somewhere around is around 32 because that's where the penalty of sending additional delta QP bits overrides the uh, any benefit any be uh, uh, benefits from adaptive QP. So um, yeah, this was one of the key improvements in rate control. Uh, we implemented a new AQ mode, um, which we uh, ported from X264. It biases towards dark dark scenes and prevents um, uh, bad visual quality blocking and uh, you know trans uh, loss of detail when there is low light under low light conditions. So that uh, that also seems to work well uh, in most test cases, not in all. Um, improved scene detection. So this was again causing our encoder lots of pains and we were constantly receiving um, you know, issues from our uh, users and you know, blocking when there was a scene change and so on because the rate control um, did not do a good job, especially in cases of fade-ins and fade-outs. So when a scene transitioned um, slowly, the rate control had trouble adapting and it kind of inter uh, it had conflicts with the slice type decision. So which one do you choose as an iframe and how do you uh, manipulate the QPs that are assigned to each of these frames so that the fade-in is a little more natural and similarly for fade-out. So we now have uh, you know, separate scene detection logic that works for slight, slice type decision and separate um, and, and a derived um, a set of flags which work for um, rate control so you can assign QPs a little more intelligently. I'm not sure it's uh, fully done yet but it certainly has improved on a lot of the test cases that we worked with. Um, so, yes, so visual quality, pure visual quality. Uh, what have we been working on? Uh, we've implemented a lot of psychovisual optimizations. Um, PsyRD, um, uh, psychovisual RD optimization, we ported, we ported it uh, pretty much um, exactly the same concept from X264. And functionally, they're very similar and they do improve um, visual quality a lot in terms of retaining detail and not blurring significantly. Sire DOQ, this was a lot more challenging. Uh, basically, our DOQ traverses all possible combinations by zeroing out certain coefficients and certain coefficient groups to find out the best uh, possible encoder decision. But uh, we found out that it was also significantly adding to blurring because our DOQ will always naturally tend to those blocks which have fewer coefficients. And um, PsyRDOQ basically traverses the path and, tra uh, and attempts to keep those coefficients which it deems as perceptually important. And you know, zero out the others, even if they are not exactly the last coefficients or the last coefficient group or so on. So um, yeah, well, between uh, PsyRD and PsyRDOQ, um, we do manage to keep a lot of the grain which has been one of the biggest challenges with HEVC uh, in terms of retaining detail and not being as soft on image quality. Um, yes, noise reduction, tune grain, very similar. Uh, we now have a noise reduction that uh, we, uh, we initially ported it from X264, but we've uh, changed it significantly. We handle intraframes separately, interframes separately, and try to prevent the accumulation that eventually causes the frames to soften and soften and ultimately there's no grain left or it causes bad grain strobing depending on the slice type. Um, so yeah, the tune grain parameter helps, um, especially if you know your content is going to be grainy, it does help significantly in keeping uh, detail. It's still a bit patchy in the sense that there are some areas of the image where you don't have any grain and there are some other areas where grain is uh, handled much better, but it's overall um, a big improvement over what we had. Yes, and we also have uh, configurable uh, transform unit sizes, config configurable um, CU sizes, so you can set the max and the min as you want. Hopefully we'll also develop um, much more intelligent methods to do this automatically rather than um, zeroing it out altogether. 
uh, visual quality where we need to go. Um, yes, softening and smoothening, these are some of our uh, biggest problems. We want to retain as much detail as possible. The culprit, we have a lot of ideas or theories or uh, um, conjectures on what the culprits could be, uh, large transforms. Um, yes, so maybe we could try biasing away from large transforms. SAO, SAO is again another um, potential culprit there with the edge and band offsets. You could nicely end up softening all your edges and uh, uh, you know blurring away the whole image if you are not careful. So these are kind of like the culprits we suspect and hopefully we will improve visual quality a little more in the coming months. But yeah, there is nothing yet and it would be awesome to hear feedback also. Tuning for content, automatically detecting, for instance, grain, automatically detecting grain and preventing rate control from going crazy with the bits. Um, that would be uh, particularly valuable, especially in the predictors uh, where it predicts the frame size. Uh, so those predictors are not very, are not able to handle sudden scene changes where you have grain on one and no grain on the other. So you essentially need to go to, through the transition phase where the predictors catch up to the content. So that's again, tuning for content is again something that we would like to look at, better grain handling. And yes, um, any other visual quality issues that you've noticed, we would love to hear from you. We, have, we do have a strong uh, Doom 9 forum where I'm not sure if uh, many in this audience uh, participate, um, participate in those discussions, but yeah, uh, people do report many bugs, uh, you know, visual quality issues through our Doom 9 forums. So it, uh, it would be great to hear from you personally here as well. Performance. Um, uh, we have also focused heavily on performance in the last one year. Uh, next, I have a slide we generated for marketing, but you know I thought it would be interesting to put it here. Um, so yeah, over the last one year, um, the real-time preset, which is uh, kind of our faster at the very at the moment, has increased by. Uh, almost 2x. So baseline, the 0, zero percent is what we started off with last year, same time. And it's increased by about 2 to 2x. Medium preset, uh, yeah, 40%. Uh, very slow, 40%, and so on. But we still have a long way to go, as you'll see. Um, X265, real time 1080p. Um, yes, uh, the ultra fast preset runs at 60 frames per second on a standard Haswell desktop. But of course, no one cares about ultra fast. Its uh, efficiency is terrible, visual quality is terrible. So that's where it is. But the other presets, yeah, is around. So a decent preset is probably in the 30 to 40 FPS range for um, 1080p uh, real time. So on a Haswell desktop, so we do have a while to go. Uh, we have uh, implemented most of the threading features we could think of. So you have the API thread, and then you have frame encoder threads, which handle every frame. Uh, these two are pretty much blocked all the time, and you expect them to be sleeping. Then you have the worker threads per WPP row. So those are your row encoder threads, and which proceed with proceed in the simultaneous wave front pattern, if you have read the HEVC documents. Um, so yeah, uh, we do get a fairly good parallelism, or at least um, we've utilized whatever we can think of in terms of utilization. However, um, if you look at a, if you look at typical Diop-Duel Xeon systems, our utilization metrics are pretty much, um, um, yeah, less than satisfactory. We have um, so the AWS systems are what we typically profile on. You have C3 instances, C4 instances, and at the very high quality presets, slower and very slow. Um, on the C4 instances, we have about 60% utilization only. And we also recently got access to a Haskell Xeon server, which is like a monster machine with 45 MB cache, and that totally killed utilization to, some, to just about 30%. So um, yeah, it's still very hardware dependent at the moment, and um, for performance, certainly one of our um, key uh, focus areas needs to be improving utilization. Which is why we implemented um, something called uh, P mode and PME to improve CPU utilization. CPU utilization actually improved significantly. Unfortunately, FPS dropped, so it's kind of uh, not particularly um, uh, useful. 
but yeah, we did our best. Um, so P mode and PME, essentially what it tried to do was um, separate mode decision um, across the various threads. So for instance, you can analyze inter 2N by 2N, rect, as well as AMP parallelly, instead of waiting for one after the other. But it turns out that the, uh, that the overhead of moving data to and fro was just too much. So um, FPS dropped, however, our utilization is really nice. <laughs> so um, hopefully there will be some architectures where this makes sense. Um, but on your uh, dual Xeon, probably not as much. <coughs> Allocating um, your frame and thread data, this is again something that we've been looking on because dual Xeons are currently the, uh, the architecture of choice for encoding HEVC. So um, we try to always see how to map the threads to the different sockets and to the cores within those sockets. So um, uh, we've been looking at making sure that threads know which socket that they should go on and you don't want two, two row threads on each one on each socket and then constantly sharing data across each other. So that doesn't make much sense. So we, con uh, we came up with this idea of thread pools which are very fr which are aware of what frame that they are encoding and therefore they always reside on one socket. And uh, so that, that had a few cons. We realized that it prevents data movement, so it's, it prevents cross socket work sharing, but it also reduces utilization because that means now you only have a smaller uh, set of threads to choose from to do your work, to hand over work to. So yeah, it reduced utilization and so for the faster presets, uh, that actually ended up uh, reducing performance. But for the slower presets, uh, we realized that it makes sense to keep all the threads available to all the frame, uh, frame encoders across sockets. Even when there is significant data movement, it makes sense to make as many threads available as possible to do work. So uh, yeah, we've done a few experiments in this direction, but certainly um, uh, minimizing data movement and maximizing utilization is one of our uh, key focuses at this point. And we'll see how that goes. AVX2 optimization over the last one year, we pushed in a bunch of code for AVX2. Um, there were some primitives that the X264 team had helpfully for us, but it also, we also had about 900 primitives that we had to accelerate by ourselves. And um, yeah, as expected, it did give a fairly um, a good performance increase. However, we also found that AVX2 uh, needs to be used a lot more strictly because it reduces frequency. So essentially, the AVX2 instructions consume more power and therefore, um, it turns down the frequency of the core, and we ended up actually uh, turning off a few of our uh, AVX2 kernels because the average frequency was much lower with AVX2 enabled. So um, yeah, that was something interesting uh, that we found. So we typically, at this point, we enable AVX2 kernels only. They have about three, at least 5% gain over SSE um, instructions. So, yeah, uh, performance benefit from AVX2 kernels, preparing X265 for Skylake. Um, so yes, uh, we recently got a Skylake architect into our team, and of course he's very, very interested to see how X265 fares on Skylake. And uh, it brings uh, several key features for X265. Just the core um, and cache improvements uh, by moving from one generation to the next should hopefully fetch us uh, good performance increase, but the memory bandwidth also looks very favorable. So this is like the memory bandwidth profile of X265. And on average, we use about 3 to 5 gigab uh, gigabytes per second, which is really not maxing it out, but there are a fair amount of peaks. So we do, help, uh, we do expect the improved memory bandwidth to help us significantly in uh, reducing contention at those points. Um, so yeah. That those are the memory bandwidth improvements um, uh, we are looking for at Skylake. And X265 performance, where we need to go. Scaling peaks at around 32 to 36 threads. Uh, there's no uh, linear scaling expected after that. So we, we are really looking at ways to improve utilization as well as performance. 
um, exploiting Sky Lake, of course, and uh, hopefully when the Sky Lake Xeons come out, uh, they'll have the AVX 512 instruction set, so maybe there are some gains uh, to be expected from those as well. We would love to hear more ideas, especially from this group, and uh, yes, uh, we would like to encourage uh, everybody to participate and join with the X265 development. Time for questions. Yes. Yeah, why would you ever want to uh, not let the CPU scheduler uh, on the operating system do whatever it wants and position the threads in whatever way it sees fit? So ultimately, that's exactly what we ended up doing. The only reason we, we wanted to try out whether uh, you know restricting thread pools to sockets would work is to minimize the cross socket um, data data movement. All right, all right. Why would you ever want to do that? You want to do you want to recall things fast, right? That's that, that's the main objective. You want to? You want to recall things fast or uh, encoding? Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. yes. But you also don't want uh, threads, say two two road threads which are working on the same frame, to be sharing data across each other, right? Well, yeah, gradually it's slow, but, uh, but if the CPU scheduler demands, you know, that's... Yeah, 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 yeah. So we were just trying out a new scheduling algorithm. It actually works for the ultra-fast presets, right. but for the other presets, uh, it, the, the drop in utilization in terms of the OS knows which are the threads yeah. that are available for work. So the drop in utilization wasn't worth it. Uh, I have one other question. Uh, how do you justify switching from a pure C uh, code base to a C++ uh, internal? <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, we uh, started off with the HM uh, code base. That, so that was like a scaffold, a set of training wheels on which we started development. That was uh, C++ based. And uh, we never really moved out. Um, we did a lot of code factoring. And at this point, we don't have a single BSD licensed file. But uh, yeah, we never really made the transition from C++ to C. Um, yeah. No, no, I mean the opposite because uh, X264 was C based and, uh, and yeah. X265 is C++. Yeah. Yes. So if we had started from X264 as a scaffold, it would have made sense to uh, you know retain it yeah. as C. But we started with the HM. Right. So that's the key feature there. Yes. Um, you tried using AX2 instructions. And that made the frequency of the CPU higher? Yes, lower. AVX2. It made the frequency lower? Lower, yes. That's a hardware feature of a CPU. <laughs> yes, so... It's simply the CPU is close that way. Huh. Yeah, so essentially what happened was these AVX2 instructions um, consume a lot more power than your SSE4 instructions. Therefore, the, the power unit in the CPU kicks up and reduces the frequency to manage its power bandwidth. So by turning on all kinds of AVX2 instructions, what we found was that the average frequency dropped. So you can see that there is a performance gain here, but still the average frequency dropped. So it made sense for us to turn on only those AVX2 kernels which had like heuristically about 3 to 5% improvement over SSC. So would you say that you exceeded a power budget? Yes. Okay. Yes, wow. exactly. Yeah, the AVX2 instructions um, are very heavy on the power budget. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Unlike X264, we don't see any uh, kind of neon or mobile platform optimizations uh, in X265. Right. And code looks like biased towards the machines with uh, high end threads. Uh, yes. Uh, not usable in kind of applications where they could wipe for up to a VGA resolution, right? not going beyond 720. Okay. Yeah, I would say um, uh, at this point, I mean, you saw the performance numbers. Um, it's probably not very suited for embedded systems, and uh, we, we are still talking to um, you know our companies um, like ARM, etc., to see if they are interested in getting HGVC running on their platforms. Um, but yeah, you are also right that the resolution plays an important factor, like um, like Alex mentioned for VP10. Um, yeah, you don't necessarily get the same performances from those larger CU sizes and larger TU sizes. So, yeah, the resolution also plays into what the embedded system actually supports. Any plans to have neon optimization in place? Um, none at the moment. No. Yes. For Sire DOQ, you mentioned uh, wanting to preserve 
coefficient groups or coefficients that impact visual quality? Yes. How are you determining which coefficients? So um, the essential idea behind or most of the, the psychovisual optimization that we implemented is that you want to keep the energy of the source frame as similar to the energy of the reconstructed frame or the decoded frame as possible. So you try to map, um, make sure that the energies in terms of in the frequency domain are as similar as possible between the two. So we do that in mode decision, which is IRD, and we do that in IRDOQ as well, where you manipulate individual coefficients um, accordingly. Yes. Uh, so, actually, uh, there is a comparison coming out tomorrow uh, from the Moscow State University. I think the X264 team may be familiar with that. Uh, so, the Moscow State University had conducted a call for Codex in April, and uh, I think BP9 participated, and uh, a few others also participated. So, we received the draft report. It looks uh, pretty good, and it should be public tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, um, everybody was disappointed it could not be presented or at, we, or at IBC. Yeah. But it will be out tomorrow and um, I'm sure we can send a link. Can you yeah. do a talk tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> minutes to introduce your, your ideas about the uh, I, I, uh, If anyone wants to, uh, we received a, a you know, draft report. If anyone wants to come, I can uh, show some results, but I'm really afraid of that recording. <laughs> so. <laughs> Oh, yeah, <laughs> we'll see. But yeah, that was a pretty extensive comparison for different use cases, fast transcoding, uh, ripping, and universal cases, etc. Um, and a bunch of the new generation codecs participated with X264 as the base. So X264 at one all the time. And yeah, that was that's a that I I guess would be a fairly um, unbiased evaluation.